Okay. Okay. So today, what we'll talk about, we'll talk about two things, right? Uh, <clears throat> primarily, the first thing would be that uh, we'll uh, talk about how do you design a system which has lot of components, right? Uh, this is what I'll walk you through and basically show you what a design looks like for a uh, for a precision equipment. So first thing, what I would like to talk about is uh, this is the device. This is the device which I want. Typically, what happens is uh, what happens is uh, you, uh, yeah. So you have a machine, any machine if you use, right? You need some positioning device, whether it's a robotic uh, arm or a positioning device. Uh, in most of the machines you need in a gantry system, uh, any any device these days, you need some sort of a positioning, positioning system, right? Or some actuation system to move things around. So how do you go ahead and uh, design something like that? The first thing which I'd like to talk about is this is something called a high speed micro machining center. And uh, what we want here is we want a very precise positioning system for machining. And uh, this machine happens to be one of the most precise machines in the country. So what happens is uh, the Z stage has a resolution of say few nanometers and X and Y are uh, roughly uh, sub micron 0.5 micron resolution and accuracies are within within a micron. So the entire thing is very precise. Now what I want to do is I want to design a stage, which basically means that uh, this kind of a device, the X, Y stages you see, which actually moves the workpiece in a given direction. So you have to make one of these devices, right? So these devices, first thing what I would like to do is if I set out to design, I need to have my design objectives. So I want to design a stage. Let, let me just say that. So I want to design a stage which has the entire accuracy for the for the for the entire travel, right? Uh, it should have roughly uh, for entire 100 mm travel, the error should be less than two microns. That's something which we need. And this is one of the machines which we have commercialized on the right side. You see, this is the machine. I don't think you can see the uh, you can see the mouse, right? So this is the machine which you have commercialized. We have a startup which actually markets these machines and uh, we want to make a stage which is basically these stages right at, at the bottom. If you see the X, Y motion of the table is imparted by these stages. So our design objective is we want accuracy of less than two microns. We want this stage to carry 25 kg of horizontal load, meaning it should be able to give 25 kg in the actual direction and the vertical load 10 kg, which means we can have it can actually support 10 kg of dead weight. And then it should be able to travel 100 millimeter and the maximum speed should be 100 millimeters per second, which roughly is six meters per minute. So I should be able to move it that fast and the resolution should be one micron and this this information we have gotten from our own uh, from, from our own experiments and the data, right? So this this stage fits into this machine. Right now we build the machines, but we buy the stages. But we want to make us make the stages ourselves. So that's why we set out to do this. So basically, what happens is to make this kind of a thing. If you want to understand, it actually requires. Let me just go ahead and show you what all it requires. So uh, basically, a uh, stage which you want to make comprises of various comprises various things. First thing is a motor. There will be a motor. Then there will be these two. Then there will be these two. Uh, there will be a, what is it called a ball screw. I can actually show you what all what components there are. Let me just try to show the video here. Uh, if I unshare, I think this should work. Let me just do one thing. Let me unshare the screen for for a brief moment, and then we'll see. Then I can show you better. Just unshare it. Unshare the screen. Okay. Okay. So I don't know if if this will do it. Can you see the 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 camera here. Hmm. 
guys can you see the camera the, this camera i don't know how to how to make it uh, pan in the in the frame you can can you see the camera i can see only one camera sir but students some students are saying they can see anyone else can see it i can see only one camera guys can you see the camera in which i am showing the stages so oh, sir we can see only one camera okay maybe off this camera sir yeah, earlier it used to. let me let me just yeah. now can you see this camera yes sir now we can see the camera okay but i want it to come it into the full uh, thing i don't know how it will come no we can see it as a full sir okay good so we can see Uh, sir you are muted sir can you unmute it so you see that yes sir we can see it this is actually the stage which you which which i am showing about so this right here is the motor this is a bearing block this here is a bearing block this again is a bearing block so you see the stage can move if i can show you the stage is moving if i can so you see the stage can move the parts of these stages if you want to see the parts of these stages are like this so this is moving right now i am moving this the stage will move okay so the main parts are this is the motor this is a servo motor i'll talk little bit about the servo motor today this is a servo motor this is a coupler this is a flexible coupling which links the shaft of the motor with the bearing block and this is this is something if you like to if i would like to show you can you guys see in the full screen this is the ball screw this is a precision ball screw there is a recirculating ball screw so there would be a a a, a thing which will move up and down on this ball screw so this, this is a ball screw and then there are precision guides you see this is one guide this is another guide and this guide has guide rails so basically in a stage what will happen is the motion will be imparted by this uh, you know ball screw the precision guides actually are used for alignment and this bearing blocks are there for support so if you really want to design a stage a precision stage the components would be the motor the coupler the bearing block the first bearing let me just move it away and then i can show you the second bearing also the second bearing will be seen in a little bit i'm moving i'm moving it other in the other direction you'll see the bearing block the second bearing block very soon see the bearing block is getting exposed right this is the second bearing this is the second bearing block this is the second bearing block this is again this bearing block is this supports the uh this support this supports the what is it called this uh, ball screw and then these two this right here this and the other one this these two are precision guides these precision guides provide alignment and this is the table which will provide the motion so i can have x like this y like this and then this is a this is a this is something called linear encoder so this is used for a closed loop control so this linear encoder tells where you are at what location you are and this is what the controller will try to get to so you basically tell them i have to go to 50 50 mm it will go on the linear scale of 50 mm so that's how you basically have these components the components would be the motor the coupler the bearing the ball screw the precision guides and the what is it called and then the linear scale which is the sensor right and then you have this this is the control this is the drive for ac servo so these are the following components which we will use for our device so what i will do is i'll go back to the so i have given you some idea of how a stage looks like right so if you have any questions let's discuss little bit did you guys understand what what a stage looks like right If you have any questions, go ahead, so that at least you have some idea what a system like a stage would entail. So the function of the coupler. Uh... The coupler, because what happens is you have to couple 
the ball screw right with the motor shaft how do you couple it how do you join those two because motor has a shaft and then i have this motor shaft has to connect to the ball screw right because ball screw is what moves ball screw converts the uh, the rotary motion to linear motion but this has to be coupled using a uh, something so this is a coupler which can take some misalignments actually this is called flexible coupling okay any other questions so you get if i have to so any any precision uh, machine whether it's a milling machine uh, lathe they will have stages like this or any positioning device wherever you use in robotics or in any other uh, discipline any positioning device will have a motor will have something to convert that rotary rotary into uh, linear motion and then to do that you need some precise devices you need some guides you need some bearings you need some couplers and you need some sensors to basically know where the position is that's how you control so if you don't have a good sensor you're not able to do a closed loop control so today i'll just discuss a how do you design something and b what kind of devices are required for controls of that kind of a device so this is this is purely informational in case you want to build machines because these day machines doesn't mean only mechanical components right a machine entails the mechanical component the actuation system the sensors the controller everything has to be there in a machine so i wanted to give you some feel for how do you design a fully functional machine right so let me just go ahead and share this uh, uh, really quick so that we can if you have any questions go ahead and ask any curiosity so this is a functional system we actually are building this uh, stage to use in our own machines okay right so basically if you see the design objectives i showed you and these are the components the components are a motor will be there so i have to size a motor there will be a coupler this right here this right here is the ball screw and this is the stage the, the stage is on top of the nut because the nut moves and this actually is this nut is like a recirculating ball screw so there is a there are balls in that thing which which will uh, move inside the grooves of the screw okay so it's not a simple nut like a lead screw nut but it is just a recirculating ball screw driven nut so that it will there will be less friction and it will move through those grooves as you rotate it will this 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 nut will do a uh, linear motion and these two are support bearings bearing 1 and bearing 2 and these are precision guides and that is called linear motion block lm block so these guides are nothing these are like dovetail arrangements so there will be rails and this will fit tightly on the rails so these have very precise guidance these are, these are there to guide the thing so that this doesn't this doesn't disorient so the orientation is perfect so let me just uh, talk what 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 are the components the first component would be the ball screw and the nut and then there will be support bearings then there are linear guides then there is motor so this these are the key mechanical components then we decided how do we assemble them how do you mount the nut how do you mount the carriage what are the base and body how do you couple it and then you basically look at the service life rigidity thermal deflections to basically do analysis to make sure that whatever i have designed is robust enough or not and it will function or not so this will give you some feel for what kind of designs i am looking for when you do your design project right so design objectives i listed the design objectives was i want a positioning stage with accuracy less than 2 microns i want it to be able to carry 25 kgs on uh, horizontal direction meaning axial direction in the axis it should be able to carry 25 kgs uh, with a very high acceleration which basically means from 0 to 100 mm per second it should be able to go go it in few seconds and that would be the acceleration which it should be able to so that that is the dynamic forces which i have to see how it will take it's not only 25 kg but 25 kg along with those inertial forces which will come while it is accelerating and uh, the maximum speed is 100 mm per second the resolution is 1 micron now let's see what else we did 
So we bought a ball screw. This ball screw we are not machining in our lab. These ball screws are very precise equipment. Uh, typically, there are different classes of ball screw. C1, C2, C3, C4. C3 is reasonably accurate. So basically, travel distance error is 8 micron in this. This is a Japanese standard C3 class. The material is 1045 carbon steel. It has 100 mm stroke, 35 mm nut length, and 75, 70 mm unthreaded length. Right? And it's fixed supported mounting. So basically, you can have two bearings to mount this. And then the encoder resolution is about 5000. So uh, we are using a, uh, what is it called? A motor, which is a stepper motor. It's actually a, a, a stepper motor uh, of 15, uh, 500 uh, RPM max. Uh, initially, we did that, uh, but it gives it gives a jerky motion. So stepper motor is not a good thing to use because it has a finite step. So what we use is something called a servo motor. I'll talk a little bit about servo motor today in the class after I finish this. And it has maximum 6000 RPM and rated RPM is between 3000 to 4000 RPM. It has a built-in encoder with 5000 lines per revolution. And the shaft diameter of this motor is 10 millimeter, right? So ball screw is something like this. It has a 2 mm lead. Lead basically means the pitch. OK. And uh, stroke is 100 mm. The, uh, the, the shaft diameter is, uh, uh, the outer diameter is 10 mm. The ball diameter is 10.3 mm. And uh, screw shaft length is 135 mm. Total bus length on 193 mm and that basic load rating is 2.9 kilonewtons. It can take 2.9 kilonewtons of load and dynamically is 1.5 kilonewtons. Uh, the weight is point, uh, the weight uh, is basically 0 0.09 kg and the weight of nut is 0 0.045 kg and pre and it is preloaded. Preloaded because it actually improves the backlash. If you, if you have the uh, preloaded thing, errors will be much lower. And rigidity is 100 newtons per microns. Okay. So that's what uh, you see here. OK. Now, what we did was we actually find out what is the critical speed of the screw shaft. So because it rotates, right? So I need to understand at what rotation it will see resonance. So I need to find out the critical speeds. So critical speeds typically are 6, 4, 5, 7, 000, 4, uh, 7, 7 RPM. So if, if this RPM you can provide, then it will be the critical speed, then it will start to vibrate, which typically is very high. We don't even go anywhere close to this, these speeds. OK, so our critical speeds are way beyond. We are going 4000 to 6000 RPM tops. I will go. So I'll never reach this critical speed of the screw shaft, right? So we are safe. The second thing would be uh, the DN value. The DN value is diameter times RPM. So my bearings which I'm using in this will have a permissible DN. So basically, if you see, uh, N2 is 6863 RPM. So I should still be okay with this, with this, with this speed. Now, uh, the static, the design loads are 5 kg. So basically, I figured out that uh, the frictional force is 0.75 Newton. So maximum load should be 60.75. The My maximum actual load, which I will do in operation, would never exceed 60.75 newtons okay because that that's what that's what i see but i have designed it for much higher loads uh, if you see the design loads the buckling loads are 16200 the permissible load is 16704 newtons so it's 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 very safe the design actual loads are very safe then what i did was i actually uh, we used this as a rotating shaft and there also we saw that the moments uh, moments are much lower than what we require. So we we found that maximum allowable diameter is actually 8.85 mm. And we have about so we with all the things we have 10 plus millimeters. So we are safe. OK, so so with all the calculations which we did, we took all the correction factors, uh, amplitude of the moments, mean of the moment, torque, both torque and uh, bending we, we used. And we saw that what will be the safe diameter. The safe diameter is 8.5 mm and our diameter is 10 plus. OK, so we are safe. 
and same thing we did uh, as a rotating shaft so this is bending and rotation combined and then this is a just a simple rotating shaft so with this still it's much lower diameters right you are still safe so the factor of safety is 4.7 so you still are very safe uh, for the for the for this thing for what is it called for your ball screw then this is the bearing design so bearing design also is actually if you go ahead and see uh, these are some of the loads which they have calculated so bearing design you have done is for uh, for 8 hours a day if we run our ball screw it is actually designed for 56 years so you are safe right you are over designing it which is okay nominal life we want it to run for 10 15 years at least if we if we sell it to somebody so now what will happen is we talk about support unit design which is like the uh, bearing so we have chosen a deep groove ball bearing and double row angular ball bearing so in the beginning i use a double row ball bearing because there's a lot of thrust so this double row ball bearing is towards the motor side towards the motor side towards this side this is a, this is the double ball row double row ball bearing and here deep groove ball bearing because here you don't get a lot of thrust the the thrust primarily comes from here you can actually if you want you can actually make it overhang also this bearing is not required also in some cases the loads are not very high you you just need one one side uh, support this can be overhang because there is already the, these uh, these uh, this this shaft this this shaft can actually be overhang also if you want if but then we want it to be precise so we also had a support bearing in the end also but in some cases the loads are not very high you don't need this bearing okay but in our case we have used two bearings at both ends on the motor side we have used double ball bearings because you need uh, you need to have uh, some thrust uh, loading uh, double row angle contact bearing because we want thrust from both the sides right that's why you have double row contact ball contact bearing and then we have a deep groove ball bearing just to support radial loads in the end so this also you can go ahead and find out support unit design so we did the solid modeling found out what the forces are then we did the bearing load equivalent load design from skf and found out that the bearing if we do at the loads which we are using it should have 164 years of life okay so it's safe in our opinion so it can run for 86310 million revolutions revolutions okay so you are safe that's the load that's the life of uh, the bearing under our loading conditions okay so then we went ahead and uh, saw that the road radial loads were about 50.62 newtons for that radial load the bearing life is pretty big the bearing life is about 154 years for both the one six one one bearing is 164 years the other bearing is 154 years so fairly long bearing lives are there right in both cases and then you need a linear guide so this is how the linear guide is there So linear guide will have this kind of a dovetail kind of a rail, and then there would be a linear motion guide which will sit on top of it. So this is the linear motion guide, and this actually guides the uh, stages. So that also we designed and we found out that this uh, this is this is these are the loads, and uh, linear guide is actually safe for those loads. So factor of safety is about fifteen point nine. So we did component wise, right? We first characterized the ball screw, then the bearings. then the linear motion systems so everything we designed and then basically what we did was we have uh, all these uh, i'm just walking with 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 some of the things which you people have used to design it so we found out that our uh, linear guide is designed for 148 years if you take into uh, take into account all the loads which it is seeing it's not seeing very high loads that's why the service life is very very high right and this is the assembly so if you have uh, each component's life so ball screw's life is 57 years uh, uh, the side support is 164 years and uh, the other bearing is 154 years the guide is 148 years so if you do a reliability study the total system has a life of 27.1 years that's how it actually works out to be so we are designing this system to last for 27.1 years for this kind of a system for a system with this loads if you exceed the loads the life will of course be much lower than this so this is basically we did some analysis based on um, uh, reliability some analysis based on the load ratings and some analysis based on finite elements also we did 
So basically, every component we analyzed separately, and then we assembled everything to find out the reliability of the assembly, the service life of the assembly. Right. So this is what turns out to be for this entire system. For whatever we have designed, this is the this is the system. And then we found out the rigidity of the system, how the system will have a combined rigidity. So this is basically the deflection of the system, the system we have modeled. So this is actually how our stage looks like if you look at it. See, this is our stage. These are the linear motion. These are the these are the components. These are the uh, li linear mo linear motion guides. So this is the linear motion guide. These are the mo so this th these are the rails, precision guide rails. These are the LM guides. Four of those. One, two, three, four. These are the guides which guide the. So it will it will be assembled on a on a base. We will have to have a base. And these this is one bearing. This is the other bearing. This is the nut which will move on this ball screw. Okay. So this is finally the CAD model of the thing. This is how the stages, stacked stages would look like if you make one. OK, so this is this is what I wanted to show you is design of a system. How do you take each and every component, analyze every component and then basically synthesize to get the entire system's reliability and the entire system's performance, right? So the system will behave differently. Your each component can live up to 100 years, but as a system, the reliability is only 27 years, right? That's what we are designing it for. It will last for 10 years or so easily because what we have, the machine which we have designed here in our case, this machine has lasted more than around 10 years. It has already been there. So this machine which I showed you here, we are still using it for past 10 years and it's still going strong. Very, very, very precise machine, this machine. Okay. okay. So that's what it is. So I'll stop here. I just wanted to give you a brief overview of how you design systems. So what I would like you to do is why don't you ask some questions if you have and then I will move on to the actual uh, description about how a servo motor works. So any questions here? This is just this, this is just to introduce you to uh, to a general design procedure. OK, how do you how do you design a, a proper system? Go ahead. If you have any questions, please ask. And then I'll move on to something else. Any questions you guys have? How did you find motor torque and RPM? OK, let me just explain how do you find a motor torque and RPM? So basically. I know that I have to. I have to drive this. Uh, this shaft, this shaft had this load. Right, so I know that I have to drive this 25 kg horizontal and 10 kg vertical load. So basically I would need. I would need speed so basically 2 pi nt by 4500 right that's the uh, the basically I, if i know the torque i know the omega i should be able to find the power so typically what happens is uh, my torque is known because i have to carry certain uh, so carry certain load so basically what i will do is i'll show you what torques we were able to get let me just show you the torque value when we did the design of actual loads, the main actual load is this. Actual so this. Moment. Moment was 8.5 Newton as a rotating shaft. M A times M B. These are bending ones. Let's just see the torque. How much we have? So my amplitude 0 0.135 Newton meter torque is there. So basically, if I want to understand my torque. My torque requirements. OK, so these are my torque requirements. If you see my torque requirement is roughly 0.135 Newton meters. So if I know the maximum torque, I know the RPM. I know what is the maximum power my motor needs to deliver, right? So it will be a function of your torque and the speeds which you need. So basically my motor speed uh, typically uh, 
is 6000 rpm so what i have chosen here is based on those torques i have chosen this this as my motor let me just go ahead and show you what we chose yes so we chose basically a 200 watt ac servo motor with 6000 rpm speed so this is what we actually used so initially we used a separate motor but but it was very jerky so then we moved on to 200 watt ac uh, servo motor with 6000 rpm so basically this 200 watt should be able to give me the required torque which i need so my required torque is not very high it's about uh, roughly 0.2 newton meters in this uh, so that uh, if you want to see uh, what will be the torque uh, minus 0.2 let's say 0.2 newton meters if i have 0.2 newton meter into uh, omega is what for 6000 uh, rpm the omega is 6000 by 60 will be 100 so 1.2 into 100 into 2 pi into 2 into pi so this is roughly 125 watt is what i am getting the peak torque requirement so we are using a 200 watt uh, motor okay so basically we have to know what is the torque required and what is the rpm and then we can size our motor with some with some uh, factor because uh, i have to design it for peak torques the motor should be able to take pay, uh, take both the peak torques and the average torque so we have to you have to use uh, you have to basically make sure that my motor is designed for those average uh, torques also and also peak torque because my peak torques can be much much higher than my average torque so when you select motors you basically design it for both because initial torque requirement must be very very high so you basically make sure that uh, your motor is selected for your uh, uh, your peak power requirements as well as your average power requirements in most cases that's how the motors are designed okay so that the peak uh, powers would be uh, roughly i would say 1.2 or 1.3 times higher than the average uh, power so in this case you can understand that we require 100 power and i am choosing a 200 watt motor any other questions any other questions you guys have Sorry. Required torque was using required torque. You don't ask any criteria. Is only for testing your uh, what what you are trying to do is you and your torque requirement for motor is not uh, ASME criteria. Your ASME criteria when you use is for design of a shaft, right? So ASME criteria. I used it for designing the uh, this this ball screw is a shaft, right? But my motor requirement uh, will not exceed the peak torque requirement. Right, you get me. So I am basically designing my motor based on peak torque requirement of my system. My peak torque requirement is point uh, roughly point one three five newton only. But the analysis, the fatigue analysis, I am doing it separately. So let me just show you the fatigue analysis. That ASME thing which we did was fatigue, just fatigue analysis. This is just the fatigue analysis. See, this is just the shaft design. So. These are the bending loads which will come. These are the amplitude of the torques. So what we did was we went ahead and we found out a diameter based on ASME standard. Uh, ASME standard, but but the motor sizing is based on just this torque right here, 0.135 newtons. Because that's what my torque. That's that's what my motor motor needs. This design is because. I have to take into account for maximum stresses. Maximum stresses have to be taken into account, and also you have to take into account uh, the fatigue line. So the SF and SUT, when you see this, the, these are primarily for for design of fatigue line. So we want we want that my shaft doesn't fail in fatigue. So I'm doing all these calculations. Using if 
Richard Goodman criteria, which is actually very, very conservative. So, it's, so this is a very conservative estimate which I am using. It will last. I'll, I'll probably require a, a, a much more diameter than this. This is very conservative with factor of safety of two and Goodman criteria is conservative because it uses ultimate. Right, ultimate and uh, the fatigue I have used is, is roughly 250, half of the, uh, so my, uh, my, this Goodman criteria, you know, right? So basically this, this has been the design fatigue. The fatigue strength which I have used is 250 MPH. Okay. So this has nothing to do with motor design. This is only a full design of your shaft of the ball screw. Okay. Any other questions you guys? I can show you the ball screw. The sharp frequency what we have used here is show you the shaft design if we want to see. So we are using this criteria. We are using this. We are using this SC here. This is this is what we are using for design in modified the criteria. This SC is we are assuming that our uh, endurance limit is 250 MP. This value. Okay. And this is very conservative. If I use the other ones, the Gerber and uh, elliptic and Soderberg, of course, is uh, the simplest one, but uh, because it this uses only yield, so this is even more uh, conservative. But uh, elliptic and Gerber are uh, will actually uh, uh, are uh, less conservative, so they will give you a, a higher diameter than higher diameter than uh, oh sorry lower diameter than uh, than this. Uh, modified Goodman. So modified Goodman will give you uh, give you the highest diameter. Uh, both Gerber and elliptic will give you lower than modified Goodman. So th their diameters would be lower than 8.5 millimeters if we calculate from. Because this is a much more conservative thing. The maximum diameter would be given by uh, Soderberg because it uses only yield here instead of ultimate. So that is the most conservative. So you are using these concepts to design your system and with this design the life which i am getting if i look at it the life which i am getting is uh, close to 100 odd years if you see the life is very very long for all the systems let me just show you again the life and then we'll move on to the other thing so this was somebody's master's project which i'm sharing you so he did this in a in in, in, life, in about about a year but uh, if you see he came out with this, these numbers for the entire system. This is a life analysis with the life analysis. Yeah. Here. So he found out that the life of the ball screw was 57 years. The side support, the first bearing, the fixed side support, was uh, 164 years. The supported side support, meaning the the uh, end support, was 154 years. And the motor guide was 150, 148. So these are the lives calculated, service life from the reliability studies. Any questions? Any other question for the system design?
so i just wanted to share somebody's work how do you design a system so what do you what do you need to do so you need to do basically uh, one would be uh, trying to basically find out whether it fails or not and then reliability both first the static then the fatigue then the life analysis because if everything goes all right what kind of life yeah any questions so this was an actual project of a master student which i shared with and he designed the entire system he built this entire system okay and he was able to get plus minus 2 microns accuracy in this in this setup actually so he designed it he built it he tested it he budgeted the error everything he did it as a part of his project okay so that's fine so what i will do is uh, i will uh, move on to the sensors and actuators the first thing which i'll talk about is the servo motors and servo drives is a very important thing uh, so servo motors and servo drive i'll talk about i will basically talk about some key terms define some key terms and then some talk about selection of servo motors so let's go ahead and talk about this so a servo motor is a structural unit of servo system and is used with a servo drive so basically let me just first uh, i'll have a small video for you so that uh, you actually it should be in the downloads so you will basically most of you probably would have heard about servo motors so this is just introductory video just to give you some sense for it this industrial robot needs a drive with particularly high demands not only does the robot have to be able to accelerate and decelerate fast also precisely positioning is required in fact here is a three phase servo motor installed in this video we will clarify the term servo motor and servo drive in general then the three phase servo drive the servo motor is a part of a servo drive whether brushless dc motor synchronous or a robust asynchronous motor but one thing in common is the detection of the rotor position by a sensor this can be a resolver or an encoder in this case you see an incremental encoder This sensor device gives feedback to a controller to keep, for example, the rotational speed or torque constant, or to reach the target position as fast as possible. The servo motor system includes the servo motor with its feedback device, a servo amplifier, and a controller. But how do these devices work together? The servo controller sends low voltage control signals for position, speed. or torque to the servo amplifier now these commands are amplified up to high power which the motor can use the electrical pulses of a sensor are sent back to the amplifier this amplifier uses this information to control speed and rotor position the job of the servo motor controller also named as the motion controller is to close the loop on the system by constantly interchanging data with the servo amplifier the motor parameters like torque speed or position can be adjusted immediately some manufacturers offer modules which combine the controller and the amplifier so you would have fewer parts fewer connections and a smaller footprint talking about an ac servo motor you usually mean a three phase synchronous motor whose rotor field is excited by permanent magnets so you get a very powerful and brushless motor of small size the stator winding produces a rotating magnetic field whose rotating speed and force is controlled by the amplifier and controller in order to position quickly all these motors must have a low moment of inertia which can be achieved by an elongated shape The functioning of a synchronous motor was already explained in another video of our learn channel. Please check our playlist. Okay. So now 
suppose you have some basic idea of what a servo motor is. Right. So I'll talk a little bit about this. Primarily, is more of a information for you. So a servo motor is a motor that drives the load, and it has something called a position detection component. So it will have an encoder. It, the encoder can be either a, a linear encoder, which I showed you in my in, in my stage, or a rotary encoder, which is built in. That. The problem with rotary encoder is that rotary encoder doesn't typically take into account of the errors which come because there would be error between at the coupler. There will be error because of uh, some sort of a, uh, what is it called backlash in the system because these these uh, couplers right will have some errors of them uh, uh, itself right because of coupling there can be some play there. So if you install a, a encoder at the end or at the end of the motor, you don't know what is happening. Those errors will be still be there. So and then there can be some deflections in the some deflection in the ball screw itself because of the high loads. Those also would creep into uh, the system, right? If you if you use a rotary encoder. So I'll talk about, but you can use rotary encoders also. So so you need an encoder for know, knowing where the exact position of my stage is. So I need to know. That's how I control, right? If I want to say move from X to Y, right? I need to know if I have reached Y or not. If I have not reached Y, I will have some error, and I will try to reach reach to that Y. So that's what uh, the encoder does. Encoder is a sensor which tells us that you are not there or you have overstepped. Then meaning come back. So this is something which tells you where you are. So right, you need some sort of position detection component. An encoder is a position detection component. That is a Built-in part of a servo motor. This is not there in a stepper. A stepper will have just one step. So a stepper will always be erroneous because you can move just one step. So you don't know where you are within that step. But with servo motor, since there is an encoder, you have a much better resolution. So servo motor, you can actually control the position, the speed, the torque. All three can be controlled to a set value, right? Using a combination of a drive or a a drive and the controller both you need to you need to have in this. So servo motors always come with a drive. So if you want to see it, let me go ahead and put my let me unshare it. I think this will help unsharing, and then let me use the camera again. So if I let me put my camera on. I don't know if you can see the camera in that case. Can you guys see my camera? Yes, sir. We can see it. So this, this is the this is the drive of the servo. This is how a drive looks like for the servo. Let me just go ahead and show you. This is how the drive looks like. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm able to focus. This is how a drive looks like. This is how the drive looks like. Right, this is a drive. This is the motor. This is the motor. This drive will. This drive will actually. This drive will link up to the AC. Uh, this this motor. Okay. So what I will do is I'll stop this and then go ahead to that. Okay. And go back to the presentation. Okay. So servo motor varies the controlled quantity using. So basically, this is how it works: a servo configuration. There is a command section which is a controller. Right, this controller can be in your uh, computer, right, or it can be integrated with your uh, with your servo drive also. But this can be a separate uh, computer-based controller also. So there will be a there will be a control card, and then there will be a software. A combination of this will be the command section, the control card, and the software. And then there is a control section, which is the servo drive. This is primarily does the amplification because the, the voltage which will come from this controller will be very small. That need to be amplified to drive the the servo motor. And then there is some. The third thing is called drive and detection system. So there will be a ball screw. 
there will be a, a servo motor and then there is an encoder so this is a servo system the servo system either there will be a robot or some sort of a positioning device right uh, or a ball screw or a linear motor this can be a linear motor which will linear motor which directly has a positioning thing so that can also be a servo linear motor also but the the trick here is for servo motor is that there will be a servo motor there will be a servo drive this drive primarily gets the the signals the error signals and you amplify because the motor has to be turned right so the motor cannot turn from these 0 to 5 volt signals right so you have to amplify it to to be able to control the motor so this is what the servo 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 drive does so you have a servo drive you have a motor with associated uh, actuation system and then you have a controller so this is the key servo system configuration a command section a control section and a drive and detection system so your cnc controller if you have anything your funoc or your uh, your uh, your whatever g codes you write those g codes are interpreted here in the command section right it tells you that you have to go from x to y the g codes will tell you and then the controller will give a command go move so this will come in some some voltage some 0 to 5 volt signal and then this will be amplified by the servo drive and it will make the motor move to go from a to b so command section comprises of your your actual controller which will be a piece of hardware and software both the hardware will be the control card which will talk to the servo drive and also there will be a software which will take the which will understand the g codes so you will you will need to have a have a, some sort of a uh, cnc software also here which will understand your g code which you are programming in your uh, in your uh, in your siemens or fanuc controller or whatever machine controller you are using okay any questions here do you have any questions in understanding a servo system so servo system will have a motor uh, power transmission mechanism basically meaning a ball screw or a lead screw or any such device okay so that would be motor plus ball screw would be one system which is drive and detection system then you have a servo drive which actually amplifies and then you have a controller section which will comprise of a software and the interface hardware which will be a card any questions here do you understand what a servo system looks like sir yeah. uh, we have a linear encoder for the stage right to know yes, the position but every every stage doesn't have a i'll i'll talk about it because linear encoder is very precise so I'll, I'll i'll talk about it as we go along uh, you don't need a linear encoder for a semi closed loop for a fully closed loop you will need a linear encoder so uh, will we still be using the rotary encoder at the back end of servo motor so, here the motor the rotary encoder will still be there but you will take your signal not from the rotary uh, not from the rotary encoder but from the linear encoder let me just show you how it works this is the fully closed loop right this is the most reliable form of closed loop a fully closed loop is used when very high precise precision is required so there what you will do is you will use a linear encoder on the table itself so you will align your linear encoder along with this ball screw motion so you know where is zero and where is 100 of this right or whatever so the motor is controlled while directly in the position so when you when you control the motor you know where exactly it is so it will be completely closed so there can be no errors there the only error would be the alignment error between your uh, uh, the alignment error between the zero of your uh, of your what is it called of your uh, ball screw and zero of your uh, encoder or any actual misalignments if there are there so those will be the only errors if you can align it perfectly right with your ball screw then there should be technically no zero no error but this is done only for a very precise system so i am building a very precise system that's why i am using a linear encoder but there is there is a rotary encoder built in into that motor every servo motor will have a rotary encoder to begin with by default okay but i am using an extra encoder here so for fully control closed loop which i am using in my device the motor is controlled directly by reading the position of the machine so i know exactly where my nut is based on my linear linear encoder gives me direct readout of the exact location of the stage except the misalignments and some errors which i have in mounting so i have to mount it very carefully and very precisely 
so that there is no error between the ball screw location and the location of the uh, of the linear 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 uh, what is it called linear encoder so there will be no errors here you don't need to compensate for gear backlash motor or mechanical system feed screw pitch error or error to feed screw torsion expansion because i am reading it exactly where it is so there what happens is in in, in a linear uh, in, in a linear uh, uh, encoder what it is is uh, let me um, is my camera on let me go ahead and see yeah my camera is on right so you can see me so it's basically you know what happens is this linear this linear encoder will have two components one is scale and one is the reader right so you can mount either the scale on the stage or you can mount the reader on the stage so it basically when the stage moves the say the scale is stationary and the pointer moves so it actually knows exactly where it is if there is no error between the pointer and the so the pointer will be mounted on the pointer will be mounted on the on the on one of the stages and scale will be mounted on the on the frame on the base frame so once the stage moves this pointer will move the magnetic pointer will move so you will know the exact position so any error in the chain if there is a backlash error there is some uh, expansion error some torsion error some deflection errors nothing will come into play because i know the exact location of the table so it's a very precise way to control okay but typically the systems are more expensive because you have an additional uh, sensor to use okay so that's why it is called a fully fully closed loop because we are using a direct measurement of the location okay any questions but you can have very precise control even with some smart algorithms and some compensation you don't even need to use that you can just do everything with your with your with your rotary encoder also okay so this is system configuration the features of servo motors are high speed precision precise high speed control servo motors excellent position speed control precise and flexible positioning is possible and they do not stall even at very high speeds and deviation due to large external forces are corrected because encoders are used to monitor the movement so you exactly know where you are so you can correct lot of those errors so this is the flow fully closed loop which which we discussed right now this is only for very precise systems so because it actually needs an additional linear encoder here so you will have motor which is controlled directly by reading the position of the machine so you use a linear encoder and comparing the actual position where this where my position is there right where my so basically i will either mount uh, the stage the scale on the stage of the top of the stage which is tied to the nut or and i will mount the scale on the base so i can do either i can either put the scale on the top of the stage which moves or the pointer on the top of the which moves so basically i will have i will know exactly where i am but the only errors which will be there is alignment errors here once you align it properly fix it properly there are no errors all the other errors such as backlash between the motor and the mechanical because i'm using i'm using this kind of a coupling right so the motor the motor uh, uh, movement and what is transferred to my shaft could can have difference because of this backlash right i showed you the coupler this coupler is a compliant mechanism right it has some finite compliance so whatever is whatever my motor is moving my shaft is not necessarily moving the same 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 angular rotation right so this has to be accounted for so with if if my if my rotary encoder is in the back i may get some errors or my food my feed screw torsion or if there is a some some temperature variation so in a in mumbai weather or in delhi weather there can be 20 degrees uh, temperature difference in a day right so imagine 20 degree temperature difference and if say i have a ball screw a large ball screw of say 1 meter what will be the thermal uh, thermal expansion in a day for 20 degree centigrade roughly give or take what is the coefficient of thermal expansion for say steels anybody what is the coefficient of thermal expansion for steels 
Give or take. Any ideas? Somebody should know it, right? Anybody? What is typically the coefficient of thermal expansion for steels? Some 10 to the power minus 6, right? You want to take 5, 10 to the power minus, minus 6 or something like that. So if I have, say, 20 degrees, so 100, uh, let's say about 100 uh, into 10 to the power minus 6 for 1 meter, right? If I have 1 meter, the temperature rise can actually move close to a 100 micron error, right? Isn't it a lot? Just by thermal expansion. So I'm just trying to give you that 20 degree temperature rise can actually lead to 50, 60 micron error, which is very high error if you talk about precise systems. Okay, some of the systems which uh, people use for optics machining, they have errors the error should be less than nanometers. Imagine, right? So this has to be do, if you don't measure it accurately, you will have to use a compensation for that, for those errors. Okay, any questions here? None, so I'll move to the next slide. So this is an open loop control. This open loop control is typically with stepper motor, not a servo motor. So in our system also initially used the self, initially we used a servo motor, but the servo motor was not a very smart idea to use uh, a stepper motor because the stepper motor has some inherent errors because it moves in steps. So if you are within a step, so some degree a step will be there that within that degree, we don't know where you are. So there would be, you can do some micro stepping, but still there would be finite error. So in this, it's, we use it, we use a stepper meter, so there's no feedback loop. The overall configuration is very simple. Positioning can be performed at very low cost, but this gear errors, ball screw backlash errors, pitch errors, this cannot be compensated because we don't know where we are. All we know is we asked it to go that much. Whether it went or not, we cannot say because we're not measuring where it is right now. Right? Open loop can be done, but nowadays what happens is there is something called step servo. So even a stepper, can have a rotary encoder and we can use it as a uh, uh, with with some uh, some some uh, some semi closed loop can be there if you have an encoder there. But open loop is only suitable for low precision, low cost, low speed. So you have a controller, you have a stepper motor drive and a stepper motor. There, what you do is you ask it to go that much. So I know that that motion can be done in say 20 revolutions or 20 20 revolutions and two two steps your two, two sectors. So you go ahead and do those uh, those things, hoping that you will reach there because you know how much you move in, how much you move in one rotation. So in this case, if I have a two, milli, two millimeter pitch in one rotation, I'll move two millimeters. Okay, so that way I know how much I will move. But I don't know whether I did it exactly or not. All I know is I ask it to move what I want to go. So there is no, this is called open loop control. You ask it to do what you want to do, but you are not sure whether it did it or not. Then there's called something called semi-closed loop. The semi-closed loop is the most commonly used in servo, motor, servo systems. Uh, the precise ones actually use a linear encoder. The, the, most of the, the servo motors are something like this, which is called semi-closed loop. There, it is faster and better than an open loop. An encoder or the detector is attached behind the motor. The encoder detects the rotation angle of the feed screw and provides it as a feedback to the machine, the travel position. This means the position of the machine is not detected directly, but it is directed with the, if you remember the video, the encoder. The encoder is basically a disc with a lot of these bright and dark spots. I'll talk more about these encoders when I go to the next class. Next class, I'll talk more about these encoders, but encoder is nothing but a disc with alternate white and dark segments. And I need how many segments I have transitioned. I count the, that, so that's how I know. So there will be a controller, there'll be a servo drive and the servo drive will have a, uh, the servo motor will have an encoder. 
This encoder, I can place it at various locations, right? Ideally, the encoder is at the back of the motor, right? So if it's behind the motor, then you have to compensate the gear, uh, the gear backlash. The ball screw and nut torsion also is affected because I am behind the motor. It's not seeing what is happening there. Then ball screw uh, uh, expansion or contraction is also affected. The pitch errors are also, you have to compensate for it. So if you are behind the motor, <coughs> you have to figure out how to handle it. Then what you can do is, you can push the encoder on the feed, on the side of the feed screw, meaning you can put it right after your, uh, what is it called, uh, right before the coupler. Okay, so then what will happen is, the gear backlash, the, the gear in the motor, motor has a gear because you have to step down the speeds. So that gear backlash is not, not doesn't need to be combusted because now you're right on the, on the motor side of the feed screw. Okay, the, the ball screw and nut torsion is still affected. The ball screw expansion contraction is still affected. Ball screw pitch error is still affected. Now, if you put the motor, uh, put the encoder on the opposite side of the feed screw, opposite of the motor. So basically, if you put it at the end of the shaft, in that case, in that case, your ball screw nut torsion is out. That also is not affected, right? Then you know the exact position of your, uh, of exact rotation of your, uh, what is it called? Of your uh, ball screw, ball screw shaft. The gear backlash composition is not required. But the only thing which he doesn't know right now is the ball screw expansion or contraction or the pitch error because these things are not there. So the, if I put the encoder on the other side of the on the other side of the ball screw, I can take care of the first two. Okay. So depending upon where you put the encoder, you can get better readings in your system. Then the servo motor, servo operation configuration controls motor operation in a closed loop. The actual position, speed, and torque is fed back to the commands, command values and errors, and the servo drive corrects the operation in real time using this error. So basically, the sensor will tell you these are the error signals, and you correct it, whether you are going slow or fast. So I can do all three controls. I can, I can control the position, the speed, and the torque. All three can be controlled. Or one of these can be controlled. Depending upon what you want to accomplish, you have the option to control the torques, the speeds, and the position. The cycle of the feet in the back, error detection, and the correction is called a closed loop control. So if you have a sensor which, told, which tells you that you are either away from the reference value, more or less, and you get an error signal, and this error signal will tell you how to correct it. You have to minimize, keep on minimizing this error signal. So that way, you know that you are exactly at the ref close to the reference signal. This is what I want. So control loop is processed either by servo drive or the motion control. So you can either use it the servo controller or you can have a motion controller, separate motion controller with a control card and a, and a software. The more control loops for position, speed, torque are independently used to achieve uh, the required operation. The application will not always be all three loops, but one or two. In some cases, only control loop for torque control will be required. In some cases, you only required uh, the speed and the current control. Uh, in some cases, you use the speed, torque, and position all control. So it depends upon what is your requirement. Based on that, you identify what you will use for controlling. And this is the principle. So basically, this is your motor. This is your control section, position control. So you basically give some, some command. Then there is an error counter. And this error counter will do the, so there will be a position control, there will be a speed conversion, and then there will be a torque control also. These three, all these three can be controlled. And this is your basically, and this is your encoder basically. Sorry. So this is your encoder, which tells you whether you are, whether you are correct or not. So basically you give, you, this is where your errors are given. So this error counter is there. So if I know the position, I'm off the position. So I know what is the error, and this has to be, Control. So I am far, so I move in the other direction. If I am overshot, I come back. If I am away, I keep on moving. So this error counter is what tells me that I am close. So basically, there is a signal from my feedback, and I have given some command. So this difference between the feedback 
and my command is the error. Okay. And I keep on controlling that. Servo motors based on brushless motors are most common. The rotor has a powerful permanent magnet and the stator is composed of multiple conductor coils and the rotor spins when the coils are powered in specified order. And the movement of the rotor is determined by the status frequency, phase, polarity and current. So these are just concepts of any motor. Okay. So motor will have a stator and a rotor. This is how a servo motor looks like. So if you look at this is the rotor of the motor, this is the stator coils. And if you pack it, this is how it looks like. This will be the motor shaft. And this shaft will have to be coupled to your, your uh, lead screw, ball screw, or whatever you want to drive. And these encoders are, servo motors are, are different types of motors. I'll just stop here because I think the time is there. So if you have some questions, you ask, and then uh, we'll talk, this, talk about this in another class also. Primarily all informative. Any other questions you guys have? Any questions? If you have any questions, you can you can shoot uh, in the text. If not. So if not, then we'll meet Wednesday for your presentations. Okay. Okay, bye-bye. Have a good day.